The Centurion Project Written by the Eighth Day of Night Chapter 25 The Castle and the Everfree The Armory Journal Entry Day 750 I wish water was easier to find. Everything is poison, and I mean everything. Plants are dead, some cities are untouchable because of the radiation, even years after they got nuked. I'm just lucky we're out in the middle of nowhere. Not that I helped anyone else, and there's still plenty of houses that are mostly untouched. Wish I could go swimming, though. Unfortunately, there isn't any water big enough to swim in without growing a tail or something. I kinda wanna try drawing for fun, but I don't know if I should save my journal pages. Who knows, though. I doodle sometimes in my old history books, but there isn't a lot of space. Elias regretted many of the decisions that he had made in his life, and this was one of the notable amongst them as he tried to swim against the weight of his armor. Only discarding his helmet and shield was not a wise decision, and he would likely should have taken the time to strip fully. But when he saw the body of water, his mind snapped and demanded that he had jump in. It felt like a primal urge, like he would die if he wasn't in the water immediately. Elias would have laughed if he had any air in his lungs. Stupid monkey brain, he thought. Now I'm going to die because I dived in without thinking, like an idiot. As he felt magic seize the back of his armor and retch him upwards towards the sunlight, Elias remembered the brief set of events that led him to diving into the small lake dressed in full armor. After the appointment with Rubber Glove, one of the other doctors had been dismissed, and with all his colleagues shaming him out of the door. As it turned out, most of the group consisted of mares, a solid four out of six, and both of the stallions had come up with the same blunt force solution for Elias' emotional issues. Since they had been observing the session with Glove, the mares immediately turned on their squirrely associate, and the Pegasus was sent back to Clownsdale with the threat of revoked medical license. The remaining psychologist had to beg Luna for a face-to-face -face meeting, in which they apologized profusely to Elias, Bookbinder, and Nightflash. They reaffirmed that they were only trying to find appropriate solutions, and that they would not rest until they had helped him find mental peace. Luna had monitored their actions closely, keeping the doctors under a strong truth spell as they spoke. After that, Luna thought it best to put Elias back on a half-guard shift to get him back to his normal swing of things. He had been welcomed back with open arms by that select group of ponies, but since it all included his friends, as well as ponies that were normally friendly towards him, like Nightshade and Midnight Chaser, Elias found that he was comfortable with the cautious glares he received once more. What the general guards thought didn't matter to him one bit. As long as he had his friends, he could cope. He also had his first royal guard trading course, and Elias had mixed feelings about it. On one hand, the physical portion felt extremely rewarding as Chaser pushed him to his physical limits, primarily through a lot of running and push-ups, but also via the occasional wrestling ambush by the Pegasus. Sure, he got yelled at by Bookbinder for coming to dinner with a black eye and a busted lip, but Chaser did too, so he counted it as a win. The other side of training was strange, however. Since he didn't have magic, Bloody Bandage had to teach him the manual way to perform an assortment of tasks that the Royal Guards were expected to know. Some, like diagnosing and treating an injury, were simple enough. They would just require practice to make his life-saving decisions fast enough. Others, like detecting illusions, were beyond Elias. The Unicorn had told him that there were little things to watch when looking for magical fakes, but Elias always failed to spot them, and had to rely on guessing to pick out the illusions. The strategy earned him several scoldings, followed by another mountain of physical punishment as Chaser lived up to his name, pursuing Elias round and round the training area, yelling in the ear the entire time. Ignoring his minor failures, both Midnight Chaser and Bloody Bandage had commended him on his opening performance and the pair had left together to craft a schedule that they would follow to work on Elias' trouble spots, while also not letting his good areas fall into disrepair. By the end of the week, things felt almost normal, and Elias felt like he had successfully caged the animal Whiteshine had let loose. The news got even better when Luna announced a brief two-day venture to her old castle. The party she assembled just happened to consist of everyone he liked as well, with Bloody Bandage acting as the group healer, while Scarlet, Bookbinder, Night Flash, and Nightshade came as guard detail for Luna. Elias thought it was a bit odd that he was listed as personal bodyguard for Luna, when everyone else was just listed as guard in the order, but he attributed it to the princess wanting to keep a close eye on him. 
they had left Canterlot early in the afternoon, teleported across the miles in an instant by Luna. The teleport was surprisingly tame compared to the one during the exercise, and Elias was able to hold down his breakfast as they prepared to set up work establishing a base camp outside the castle. Something had caught Elias's eye instantly, however, and the crystal clear blue waters of the lake invited him to like a siren song. Elias coughed and hacked as he was dangled upside down. Three ponies glared at him in obvious anger, though Elias was mildly surprised that Luna was one of them. She let Elias flop onto the beach, where Cliffbinder proceeded to jump on top of him with a towel in her magic, wiping him down as she glared daggers at the human, daring him to move. Nightflash quickly joined in, though he did less drying than he did aggressively snuggling and penning. Luna frowned on him as she let the two ponies do their work. Do you care to explain your actions, guardsman? Without a word to anyone, you sprinted into a deep body of water with full armor and proceeded to nearly drown. Was that your intention? Elias smiled weakly at her. If you'll believe me, the answer is no. It's just been forever since I've been swimming and the water just... sparked something. I felt like I was a kid at the swimming pool for a second. He sighed and laid back. <sighs> Sorry, princess. I didn't think. He frowned and his eyebrows furrowed. Been doing that a lot lately. I have no idea why. It's like... He paused. I don't know. I seem to get more... urges? I don't know. My instincts are suddenly going haywire and I have no idea why. Luna tilted her head. Could it have something to do with the royal assessment in the subsequent fight with Whiteshine? Your reports were very clear that you seemed like a different person. Elias shrugged, wincing as Nightflash danced across his chest to snuggle his left arm. It hasn't happened in the past. I've never had split personalities. And I don't see how one little beating nasty it might have been could have suddenly caused me to act a fool. He scowled and shook his head. <sighs> I'll get it under control, princess. Sorry for making an ass of myself. Elias hissed as Bookminder smacked the back of his head with her armored hoof. You should be sorry. Making me worry you like that. The unicorn then did her best to wrap around his head, but huffed in aggravation when she couldn't find an angle that allowed her chest fluff past her armor. It gave Elias a moment to breathe, and when she continued to be unsuccessful, he stood up, giving her a quick scratch under the chin as he cast about for his discarded shield and helmet. Luna levitated them over, her eyes searching Elias as their gazes met. The unicorn was clearly looking for something abnormal, but Elias had nothing for her. The urge to go to the water, was as suddenly as it had come, had vanished, and he felt normal, calm. He took the helmet plopping it atop of his own pila as he turned away silently, walking towards the sack of gear that the ponies had insisted on bringing. Why they weren't simply using sleeping bags and the castle for cover, Elias didn't know, but he wasn't about to argue since Luna had magically transported it all. He snatched his well-weathered ruck from the stack of gear and moved off to a copse of trees near the shoreline. Laying his weapon against one of the trees, Elias undid the top flap of his ruck and removed the large tarp he had gotten from the castle quartermaster. The pony had given him a strange look when he asked for a piece of cloth when everyone else was asking for a tent, but Elias knew what he wanted. A lesson he learned quickly was to never carry something that couldn't be used in at least five ways, and unfortunately, a tent fit that description. The tarp was tighter and took up less space anyway, so after fetching the bundle of rope from his ruck, Elias set to work, breaking off some of the smaller tree branches to use as tent stakes to lean into. It took his well-practiced hands less than a minute to get it set up, and Elias quickly moved to the second part. After covering the dirt with a healthy bed of leaves, Elias moved to the edge of the water with a knife in hand, locating and cutting away enough reeds to make a sleeping pad. He would need to let the reeds dry before he laid down his sleeping bag, but with all the sun still shining, it wouldn't be much longer than an hour before his bed was ready. Elias stretched tall as he looked at the ponies, all with tents in various states of completion, all of whom were staring at him as if he had grown a third eye. Elias yawned and scratched his chin. <clears throat> what? He asked Bookbinder, who just so happened to be the closest. The unicorn glared at him. What do you mean, what? Where's your tent, Elias? Elias took a step to the side and gestured towards his lean-to. Bookbinder gave him a deadpan look. Elias, you know full well that the little thing isn't a tent. Maybe a pretend tent that foals use during the day, but not something that ponies actually sleep in. Elias shrugged. 
Good thing I'm not a bony then, isn't it? That, he said, pointing to his lean-to, is all the tent I've ever needed. It's light, easy to maintain, and keeps the rain off. Can't ask for anything better in a tent. Bookbinder rolled her eyes and huffed loudly. She didn't say anything else as she continued helping Night Flash to put up their shared tent, and Elias stretched again as he watched the ponies work for their moment. When he stripped off his wrist guards, as well as his cuirass, he rolled his shoulders to limber them up and reached for his shield. He then tossed his helmet onto his reared bed as he strapped the rectangular shield on his back. Feeling lighter and ultimately refreshed from his near-drowning experience, Elias moved quickly to the supply pile, snatching a shovel as he set to work. First, he moved towards the tree line, digging a shallow trench for a bathroom. Once he was satisfied that it was wide enough, he moved back towards the lake. Here he dug another hole, keeping it wide but shallow as he scanned for sizable stones. Once the hole was good enough to fit his needs, Elias circled it with half a dozen broad, flat stones, acting like a wall between the soon-to-be fire pit and the grass of their camp. Once he finished digging the pits, Elias moved back to the supply pile, stacking the large crates into manageable snacks. For some reason, Luna had decided they needed weeks' worth of food, as well as a fully functioning stove for their two-night trip. While he wasn't complaining about the excess, Elias wondered who she expected to cook at all. His skill ended at a campfire in a frying pan, where just about anything could be burned into edibleness, especially the fuzzier foods. It wasn't moldy if the mold was on fire. It was well after sunset before Elias, with the help of Night Flash and Scarlet Shield, finished stacking the crates in their appropriate piles. Now she'd fire up the stove, and she and Bookbinder began prepping dinner while Blundy Bandage stood watch, glaring stoically into the dark of the woods. While the pair of ponies cooked, Elias began to collect firewood. As he returned to the fire pit with another stack of branches and logs, Bookbinder gave him a curious look. What's all that for, Elias? Elias bounced the weighty branches on one arm, and he crouched down and began building a teepee. Warmth, light, the usual. I'd say cooking as well. He glanced over his shoulder at the large set of burners. But apparently it isn't needed. Nightshade rolled her eyes. I don't know how somebody like you can be so sheltered right, but it's gonna guess you never had to use extra features your armor is enchanted with. Elias sighed as he dropped the bundle to the ground and drew his lighter from a pouch on his belt, using his knife to create a bed with wood shavings to light the fire with. Don't have magic, Captain. Can't say that enough. He grabbed some dry grass as well as creating a fine bed of tinder. Elias quickly showered the bed with sparks, and as it began the light, he broke the twigs from his branch pile, slowly building the fire until it would burn through larger logs. Orange light filtered dimly across the clearing, just as the moon rose and Luna exited her tent. She blinked as she stared into the flames for a moment, and then she looked at Elias who was still crouched beside it. A camp tradition of yours, Godsman. Elias shrugged. Can't use magic for everything. Maybe you are all fine at night, but for me, it gets dark, chilly, and nasty when the beasts come out to play. The fire should keep them away for a little while, though. Luna scoffed. <laughs> Godsman, as long as I am here, the beasts of the Everfree wouldn't dare attack our camp. They smell an anacorn, and they know what they will face as they challenge me. As for the cold, I'm more than sure God's pony bookbinder and night flash would have little issue sharing their tent with you. Elias snapped into the branch in two as he poked at the fire, ensuring that the logs wouldn't collapse when they burned through. You're probably right, princess, but then Bookbinder would use it as leverage. She already has far too much blackmail against me. I can't well throw fuel at that fire. The green unicorn snorted and shook her head. <sighs> Elias, you know full well that I would never try to blackmail you. The fact that you would think of such a thing of me is quite frankly insulting. Elias looked up from the fire and met her eyes. You're telling me there isn't some sort of party or event on your calendar that you want me to come with you, that we both know that I won't go to. You won't at least make an attempt but forcing me to go by using some kind of leverage. Bookbinder opened her mouth to deny the accusation, but then she frowned and thought, staring at the pot of boiling soup. She sighed and shook her head. Dang it, Elias. If you weren't my baby boy, I'd be mad that you're clever enough to even think about that kind of thing. Nothing is happening really soon, but still, there's bound to be something that I want you to come to. Elias spread his hands in victory as his point proven. He then looked back to the fire, giving a few more pokes before he got to his feet. As he started to crack his collection of wood into more manageable pieces, I should called for dinner. 
and let's continue to work for a moment, waiting while everyone lined up to get their servings. Only after everyone else had gotten food did he move to the stove, scooping himself up a bowl of bean soup the ponies had made. He snorted while he snatched up a roll. Despite their mockery, the ponies flocked like flies to a lantern, sitting around the campfire in a circle as they relaxed and chatted. Elias plopped down between Bookbinder and Luna. The unicorn smiled at him for a moment before she and Bloody Bandage continued their quiet conversation. Elias didn't bother with a spoon as he ate. He simply drank the hot soup, ignoring the burning sensation he felt on his tongue. Finishing the mail the fastest, he used the bread roll to clean his bowl out, leaving it without any obvious trace of food as he popped the soggy bread in his mouth. Then he gave him a funny look as she watched him eat, then cleared her throat drawing everyone's attention. <clears throat> as you all know, the expedition of Oz is intended to identify and recover any dangerous artifacts that may have been left in my old castle. I do not wish for anything to fall into the wrong hoof simply because of my negligence. She looked to Nightshade. Captain, you and God's Pony Bookbinder and Night Flash will be responsible for protecting our camp and preparing the equipment we shall need for our complete research tomorrow. Royal God's Pony Bandage, Godsman Bright, and I shall conduct a short scouting mission tonight to see if we can locate any undestroyed areas of note. She rose to her hooves, levitating her bowl back to the stove, and glanced to his left saw bloody bandage doing the same. Elias gave a short sigh before he got up, setting his bowl down as he took the canteen from his belt, taking a quick swig of water as Bloody Bandage put her helmet on. The unicorn moved to stand beside Luna, so Elias did the same. Luna cocked her head as she looked at him. Do you not wish to take your armor, guardsman? Elias shrugged and scratched his ear. If we're just scouting, then it'll be easier without it. I can stay quieter and move faster. Besides, it's not like I'm leaving my shield behind. Luna looked like she wanted to argue the point, but she decided to remain silent as she turned away, leading them through the forest on the path that seemed to know well. It took them a few minutes, and the tall gray walls of the castle of the two sisters came into view, bathed in moonlight. It made it an intimidating sight. Though it was in a state of heavy disrepair, the walls and towers were still daunting to look at, and Elias could only smile as a slight shiver of irrational nervousness raced up his spine. He almost wished the ponies would walk faster so that they could get closer to the structure soon. Luna took her time, however, and from the look on her face, Elias could tell that seeing her old home in such a state was painful for her. Unfortunately, he had a hard time relating to that feeling. After years of picking through decayed and dead buildings, Elias had become numb to the sight, and as they crossed the frayed rope bridge that led to the castle, the eyes began flicking around, searching for anything that looked slightly less faded or unbroken. He imagined once they were inside, his scavenger instincts would return in full, and it drove his excitement up a little more. The front doors were already blown wide open as they walked into the stone steps. Elias could see that time had not been gentle to the exposed interior. Much like the dozens of government buildings he had plundered, everything was in tatters. What had been a rug or carpet of some kind was in barely recognizable tatters, its color diluted by the years of exposure to the elements. What spots of the carpet did exist were coated with a black mold, making the remnants look like a little more than pocket of moss. The walls were adorned with tattered banners that were all stained black and green with water damage. The previous emblazonment destroyed after centuries of rain. It had been dry for the past couple of days, otherwise Elias wouldn't have been surprised to see water dripping in from the broken skylight and windows. Luna let up a deep sigh as she stared at her old castle. <sighs> It was not always like this, she absently noted. Not just the damage, but the emptiness. It is far too quiet in a place that was meant to act as the center of Equestria. And even though it was abandoned, it didn't have to end up in ruin. I wish Tia had taken better care of this place, no matter what battles we fought here. Elias shrugged as he wandered down the left, running his finger across the flagstones as the supported the decaying roof. I wouldn't think about it too hard, princess. Dwelling on the past won't allow you to move forward. If it bothers you so much, fix it up. If nothing else, it would make an interesting historical attraction. His fingers caught briefly on a deep furrow on the stone. Either way, just thinking won't do you any good. Act or forget. Otherwise, it'll continue to bother you. Lyon stopped as his toes bumped against a worn set of stairs, leading up to a series of dark hallways. He scratched his forehead as he glanced back, finding Luna staring at him with a curious look on her face. She didn't say anything, just stared. So Elias went back to investigating the room. 
The ceilings were tall, with great holes marring the stonework. Moonlight was plentiful as it seeped through both the walls and the ceiling, and Elias imagined that even without the light from Luna and the bandage's horn, he could see relatively clearly. He really wondered what the place looked like in its prime. He'd never seen a castle before coming to Equestria, and the ruin looked far more impressive than anything Canterlot had to offer. A small part of his mind briefly hoped that Luna would act on his words and restore the castle, at least somewhat. He imagined it would be a sight to see. The alicorn moved softly to the stairs, sighing again as she stared up. Royal God's Pony Bandage, you shall remain here. Return to the camp to find help should Godsman Bright and I not return within the hour. As Bloody Bandage saluted, Luna moved forward. Elias followed behind her, his eyes scanning every square inch as he began appraising, looking for signs of still intact doors. They went to the left first, walking down a long, dark corridor. Elias quickly noticed that outside the main area, the building was much more intact. No light entered the hallway they walked down. And were not from Light of Luna's Horn, he would have needed to leave the castle to make a torch. The soft blue glow was enough to see by, however, and Luna led the way silently. Her steps measured and slow as she looked at the barren hallway, with what looked to Elias like regret. They passed a few closed doors, but Luna seemed to have a path in mind, so he remained quiet as they walked, making silent notes of interesting doorways that he would like to explore further when they returned. It blindsided him when Luna asked, What were your parents like, Godsman? The suddenness of the question nearly caused Elias to trip, and he had to use his hand to balance himself before he could begin to process an answer. I would think you know them better than I do, Princess. Elias responded as he tried to avoid the actual question. They've been your guards for all these years. Luna snorted. <laughs> I think we both know that was not the speaking of Bookbinder and Night Flash, but let us discuss them anyway. Answer me truthfully. Have you actually accepted them as your parents, via the offer or even within your own mind? Elias sighed and shook his head his left eye twitching as he tried to distract himself with the blue-lit walls. No, he replied honestly. It's not their fault. They're great ponies. Wonderful, fantastic ponies, really. But that's the problem. The two of them are just the best kind of people. And I? He chuckled weakly. <laughs> I am definitely not. The more I see them together and interacting with everyone else... I just think about how having me nearby is just holding them back. I'm a burden on their lives, even if nobody besides me is willing to admit that. He sighed again and glanced over at Luna. Am I safe in assuming this conversation will stay between us? Luna nodded. If that is your wish, Gartman, I will not speak a word of this to anyone else. Even your observer shall be deaf to your words. Elias nodded and looked away, thumbing at the line of his chin. I love them both. He continued, but to admit that they are mom and dad is hard, very hard, so hard that doing so may either kill me or drive them away, and the more I see them, the more unsure I am about which is worse. Luna sighed. You are still suffering from your self-worth issues, I see. Elias snorted dismissively. <laughs> it's not about self-worth, it's about learning from the past. Everyone knows what I'm like, and part of me is terrified that Elias, that beat the hell out of Whiteshine, is lurking far too close to the person that loves Night Flash and Bookbinder. If the two ever found a way to mix... You fear you will hurt them, directly or indirectly, Luna said. I understand, Godsman, and while I believe that such a fear is baseless, especially given that your attack on Whiteshine was in defense of one of your adoptive parents, I shall not push the point. You will figure out your feelings out with time. I know it. Elias felt grateful for her willingness to drop the subject as they turned a corner and Luna began carefully searching the hall for something. Having her stare at him for a bit was unnerving, especially when he was being soft and talking about his inner thoughts. The scented voice in his brain was bitterly grumbling about the breach in both safety and privacy, but Elias ignored it. He hadn't been too specific yet, and he had revealed nothing about his history. He stopped short of chastising the voice being paranoid, however, and he took a mental step back to make sure that he was being paranoid enough. All of his silent efforts would only work to keep quiet. Spilling his guts to the first pony that asked wouldn't do him, or them, 
any good. Luna remained silent as she continued scanning the hallway, her green eyes searching carefully. Lies moved forward, brushing past her as he scanned the hallway for anything hidden that might lead to somewhere of importance. False walls, covered floors, unopened doors. Elias scanned for them all, keeping his hand along the wall as he felt for hidden triggers. Luna found something first, nudging Elias in the back with her wing as she stared carefully at the torch scone. If I remember correctly, this should lead us directly to either the armory or my sister's room, Luna said. Oh, it's a trap, but I am certain that is not the case. Elias snorted. Just mentioning the fact that it could be a trap makes it a trap. And if it's a trap, I would recommend not pulling it. Luna scoffed. Nonsense, guardsman. I'm fairly certain I remember where the traps are in my castle. She tilted her head for a moment, inspecting the scone with her magic, before she smiled, took a step back, and then pressed down on it. The floor dropped from beneath their feet. There we go. Ending it on a cliffhanger, baby. So, <laughs> this chapter is rather long, so I'm going to break it up into three parts, likely all being around the 20-25 minute mark. Hope you guys don't mind. And there's almost nothing better than just seeing a casual trip. I mean, this is Elias' real first trip outside of the castle, besides his uh, hanging out with Bookbinder from earlier chapters, properly out of Canterlot. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't go too bad. Given the cliffhanger, maybe what we'll see in the next chapter. What won't be a cliffhanger is how much I love my Patreons. Thank you, Chase the Master, HKH4 aka Texture, The Animated Ghost, Solus, Mark the Wolf, Stu Hex, and a thank you to our new Tier 2 Patreon, Captain Bloop. Ah! Fuck, what the hell was that for? You know full well, Fire. He missed the special call last time and was sad. That's not right. What's not right is playing favorites and specials. Oh, like you play specials with that bug. Fine, fine. You can end it. I don't even care anymore. I'm being bullied by my own damn voices. <clears throat> Thank you, Captain Blue Shadow, for your support. It means a lot to us and is appreciated a ton. If you'd like other ways to support, considering, uh, subscribing? That's right, baby. Subscribing, leaving a like, and commenting down below. Ugh. Anyway, being bullied aside, this has been Firehearth. Have a wonderful day.